We are live. Good evening, everyone. Back here at the barbershop once again. We're celebrating Domestic Violence Month and Breast Awareness Month. So we got our purple and on our pink celebrating those things that happened this month. We have an outstanding panel for you tonight. We're going to be focusing on domestic violence, but we're going to be focusing more on being uh, interrupters and, and bystanders and, and be able to help segue through that and understand how we can be interrupters in domestic violence situations in our neighborhood. Too often, too many times, people are out there and domestic violence things are happening, but we're going to learn from some experts tonight about how we can be interrupters of that and be able to help out with trauma that happens during uh, these events. So as always, I have my colleagues here with me and I'm gonna introduce them. Uh, one who just came back from the motherland so far away in Africa. Uh, he just talked to us about the things that he was doing in the motherland. Hey, Jerry, how are you doing with that long flight back? Yeah, I'm excited. I was able to get past jet lag, so I'm totally refreshed. I definitely love the opportunity to be out in Egypt and just get the culture. But I'm truly excited about having this conversation. And what does that look like being a, a bystander? How do you appropriately help support? And um, coming from DYC as deputy director and ambassador of mental health, there's nothing like knowing how do I help. So I'm excited about the conversation we're about to have. And with that, I'm going to pitch it over to my big brother, my mentor, uh, Mr. Mike Bobbitt. Evening, Jerry. Evening, Scott. Good to be back in the barbershop. Uh, I'm glad that we're going to spend time talking about domestic violence right at this time. October, as you guys know, is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and it's really important that we spend some time on this topic, and it's really important as men that we spend some time on this topic. You know, I was getting ready to log on, and I was talking to a colleague, and I you know, won't say anything about who the colleague is. I keep the confidence, but I carry the story. I was telling uh, my colleague, you know, my daughter just became a teenager. Oh. And first thing <laughs> I'm scared already. And my, exactly. Oh, first thing my <laughs> colleague said is, well, you know, uh, my daughter's been dealing with an issue with someone in the community stalking. And I had to get the village involved. You know what that's like. You're a dad. You got a teenager. And I was like, whoo, like you got to be careful what you put out in the universe. You know what I mean? I was like, okay, <laughs> so far, everything is good. But why have we been having these conversations for years? because we have sons and daughters and we want to interrupt some of these patterns of behavior that are not helping our daughters and they're not helping our sons either. So that's why we're here. That's why we're here. And I'm glad we're talking about what you call it roles for bystanders or remember in the city, we were talking about be an upstander, not a bystander. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's about how do we engage? So I'm, I'm glad we're going to have this conversation and we got, we got heavyweights in the building. We yes, sir. Yep. Building yep. Yep. do. So, Shall Mike, why don't you go ahead and start introducing some of your heavyweights that we have? Let's I will, get it. Let's uh, get it. First of all, I got to take it back to 2007, maybe. And if I know anything correct about the issue of domestic violence at all, and if I know anything correct about how men can engage on the topic of domestic violence, is because of this gentleman who has graced us with his presence this evening, Dr. Oliver Williams from the University of Minnesota. I met this gentleman when we were doing a project together. It was the Vera Institute of Justice and the Institute on Domestic Violence in the African-American Community called the Safe Return Initiative. And we're having these good conversations with people and, and letting people know. A lot of people, when your loved ones go to prison, they don't even know why the loved one was incarcerated. They don't even know when their loved one is coming back. And they may be very eager for them to come home. And sometimes some people in the family not eager for them to come home. And like, what are all the things we need to know behind the wall? What are the things we need to know out in the community when people are coming home? If I learn anything good from any of that, it's because of my big brother, my mentor, right. Dr. Oliver Williams. Say hello to the people. Thanks, Please. Mike. I appreciate it. You know, we got we did a lot of good work with that. I appreciate it. I appreciate your comments about it. But we learn from each other. So, thank you. You're gracious to say so. Another heavyweight in the building is you, Lester Douglas, the deputy director of Men Stopping Violence. I'm going to tell you a quick, funny story about that gentleman. So first getting trained by Dr. Williams, and I'm in a training that you, Lester, and another gentleman by the name of Dick Batrick are doing for judges. 
on domestic violence and racism. And the domestic violence part, the judges and the probation officers too were ready for. But once they started hitting them with looking at racism and the intersection of racism, I could, you ever sit in a meeting and you watch people get uncomfortable? You start hitting them with truth yep. and you notice how people are shifting. And this tag team, you less have said his piece and, and, and Dick was a white gentleman. And when he said, well, no, I have a historical privilege for being a white man. I can just put my socks and shoes and walk out in the world and, and the way racism is, is set up. I already have a privilege. I have to actively do things that, ooh, you can watch people <laughs> squirming in the meeting. And it was so powerful for me to see when people of different races come together kind of serve up, all right, get ready for you, Lester's part, you Lester, all right, I'm going to pass it back to, to Dick. That's the modality, and that never left me. I could keep going, but I have to leave time for the actual barbershop. Uh, welcome to the barbershop, you Lester Douglas. Thank you, Mike. Good to be here. <laughs> Another <laughs> modest man of a few words. Right? Okay. So um, I'll do one more, and I'm going to uh, pass it over to my, my co-host. Hannah Pennington has been my my colleague, I was going to, yeah, I have to look at my language. I think we always have to look at how violence pervades our language. I started to say my comrade in arms, but it's not about the violence. They're really my comrade in times of, of peace, but in terms of, of, of covering the waterfront and what do men and women need to know. This is not the first time someone from NGBB has helped co-host one of these conversations. We've had several colleagues from her agency here and uh, we thank, but we haven't had her in the barbershop specifically. So please welcome for the first time to the barbershop, Hannah Pennington. Wow, this is an honor because I've heard so much. I have even sat in and now I get to be here. I feel super honored. I do have to say that I'm happy to be here in my own capacity. And I hope um, maybe someday I'll come again even because this is amazing what you've been doing and you've been so steadfast in it so kudos to you all for doing this um, and keeping the dialogue going but I'm also here on behalf of another heavyweight um, my boss and my mentor Cecile Noel who is the commissioner of the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence um, and she um, wishes she could be here um, it is domestic violence awareness month CVAM as we like to call it and it's a lot and there's a lot of events. So um, I'm, I think this is my last official panel event. So I'm feeling, feeling a lot of love for this event, uh, but thank you for having us. And I know she, um, uh, she would love this conversation too. So thanks and um, welcome on her behalf as well. Thank you, Hannah. And thank the commissioner for us once again. Dr. Williams, uh, yeah. you were excited and enthused enough to, to collaborate on this you actually brought crew with you. So I'm gonna ask you if you would please introduce your colleague, uh, Dominic Waltower, and then we'll kick it over to Jerry and Scott for our other panelists. Well, you know, uh, I learned about uh, Dominique. I think we emailed each other. And uh, when I had a chance to sort of talk to him, I've been uh, trying to address uh, issues about change. And uh, I heard one person say, the only way that you know that a man that had a history of violence has changed is when he's dead. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a little extreme. And, and there's things that we have been able to talk about over periods of time. You know, there's a, a right time to be able to have conversations about things. So Dominique and I had a chance to talk uh, over a period of time. And... Um, you know, he's a person that's changed his life. And he's got this um, uh, uh, from being violent to being nonviolent. Uh, one of the things that Dominique does, he's got this uh, um, project called the Coach Approach. And it's really laid out really well in terms of uh, talking about different sets of things and, you know, about change and, and uh, helping people sort of keep. Uh, and inside in terms of what it is that they need to do in the process. But um, among the other things that I thought was uh, important, if you go to will2change.org, you'll see Dominique telling his story about change. And you'll see his ex-wife tell her story about her process of change. And they got to the point where they said that they... Uh, 
needed to uh, divorce because they needed to be able to do the changing in their own time. And they talked about traumas in their life. And I'll let, I won't tell you the story. I'll let them tell you the story if you go there. But the very powerful uh, stories about change and transformation. Dominique uh, does work for the military and he does work with the military associated with it. And I think he's also developing a batter's intervention group in uh, San Diego, California. And so anyway, I have a lot of uh, respect for uh, Dominique. I think he's the real deal. And, uh, um, and so glad to have him uh, together. We've done a couple of other things together, but uh, I'm glad to, to know him and to interact with him. And I want to tell you about someone else doing something really good. His name is Chris Huffine and he's in uh, Portland, Oregon. He's got uh, uh, a program uh, that uh, people come to his programs for 26 weeks and 52 weeks but he has people that have stayed in this program for 11 years. So when you talk about change and transformation, that's among the good things that they uh, are working on too, which is, I think, the right thing. To do. I think the right, the right, the right. And so with that, Dominique. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you for everybody on here. Everyone's watching and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. This is definitely a worthy, worthy, worthy uh, cause and event. And so um, as Dr. Oliver uh, spoke about, I am I'm a violence prevention advocate and I come from a different angle. I come from the angle of someone that's a former offender. So I come from that that side of the street, if you will. And my, my focus is working upstream with those who cause harm because um, no one is speaking to them. No one is speaking to them. No one is, they're just kind of left out and they keep continuing the same uh, harm that they've, they've been doing. Um, and my work, I often talk about the process that I had to go through in order to change. And, you know, we often talk about accountability, but there's healing that's necessary as well. So I add, I add the healing component to accountability when I'm working with uh, different individuals. Speaking of my work, I, uh, as Dr. Oliver mentioned, I, uh, I work on base here at Camp Pendleton. Um, I just left a presentation this morning at Barstow, a six hour drive for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, it was a great event. Um, so I do prevention and ed education for the military. Um, and I also uh, work in my own capacity, in my own nonprofit, and I do uh, different speaking events as well. Um, I went to Fort Hood to speak, Joint Base Lewis McCord, um, Montgomery, um, um, uh, Air Force, Montgomery Air Force Base in uh, uh, Alabama as well. So I travel quite a bit um, with this message. Um, what I've realized is that uh, people that need to change need to see someone that's changed. And so um, they need to see someone to give them permission. And so um, that's pretty much the, the um, arena that I've jumped into and I, I am full speed ahead with this. I have started a program here with the district attorney of San Diego where um, we are working with low level domestic violence offenders. And we have, a, um, I've developed a course that's already started. We're in week five right now. It's an eight week course uh, for, for them. And it's just, it's starting to roll. And then we're gonna, we're gonna work on some other programs after that. But, Definitely busy, uh, busy during my day job and when I leave in this arena, uh, primarily working with men on, on helping us uh, get to a better place. So thank you all for listening and I, I look forward to this, uh, this dialogue. <clears throat> Pleasure to have all you and Scott, we're not done yet, right? Scott, you and Jerry have a couple more people to introduce. Yeah, I'll let Jerry go and I'll do my mine after Jerry. Okay, go ahead, Jerry. Not a problem. I get to introduce one of our uh, one of our favorites, our um, and just a returning great brother um, who is the executive director of Connect. Connect works with NYC's communities to prevent uh, interpersonal violence and promote gender justice. Uh, and I'm I'm actually understating it, but it's an honor and privilege that I even get to call him brother. And I also take a lot of gems from him. So I present to you coming back for a fresh shape up or maybe even a full cut, Quentin Welcock. I appreciate that, Jerry. It's, it's an honor to be on uh, at the round at the uh, barbershop once again. I don't get my hair cut that much anymore. As you can see. <laughs> uh, I actually used to be a barber, and I started my work you know, engaging men 
around um, abusive partners in a barbershop after hours. So it's good to be full circle. And I, I, I'll be remiss not to mention, um, I live by a firehouse, so excuse the, uh, the ambulances. Uh, I think Hannah knows being on the Upper West Side, how it is. But um, <clears throat> Oliver Williams and Lester, and I actually, I first met Mike Bobbitt at an IDVAC conference, um, I believe in Minnesota, probably my first week at Connect. So we're talking about, uh, you know, 20 some odd years ago now. So I was kind of, you know, put right into the fire, so to speak, in terms of, you know, what this, what this idea of engaging men and boys around violence prevention and, you know, developing effective intervention work. So it's an honor to be, um, you know, in the barbershop, swinging in the chair and getting a little lineup for my beard. And uh, it's also great to be with uh, Hannah once again, colleague in this work for many, many, many years. I really appreciate her and what she brings to the work. And Alicia, good to see you again. And brother AU, um, AU and I probably go back even farther than anyone on this uh, on this panel back in Southern, Southern Queens Park, where I actually first started doing my work with young men who are in the summer camp, who are impacted by really violence in the home and making you know, tough decisions in the community, which kind of led to the issue of gun and gang violence for some of these young people. But really digging the, digging the surface and fit, realizing that many of these young people were experiencing or witnessing domestic violence in the home. So which led them to, um, you know, being out in the streets and, you know, making, uh, without a judgment on gangs or that culture, getting something that they were not getting at home. So um, I used to work with uh, AU, Southern Queens Park Association a long, long, long time ago when I was working with their preventive agency, uh, families in need and adolescents in need. So I appreciate you, Rob, brother, you. Appreciate you. Thank you, man. Oh, Thank you. All right, Quinn, we got to call this the Connect Barbershop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all the Connect alumni here. <laughs> no. Yes. We just have to slide your chair on in here also. So uh, before I introduce AU, which was going to be my final one, but I want to introduce a lovely young lady that I met uh, that came to my director's meeting from One Love. And I love the idea of the name because they're talking about love. They're not talking about, you know, the, the other part of it. And we have to have more love in this world. And I may mess up the name a little bit, but it's Nelicia Williams uh, from One Love. And she has a lot of great information. I would definitely tell you to check out their website. I hope that she makes sure that she gives us the website has great videos, especially for young people to look at and watch. We're even going to be doing it with our older guys. But, but Alicia, turn it up to you. Thank you so much, Scott. I am so happy and so grateful to be in this space tonight. It is my first time here and I really do feel honored. Um, I felt that when you said that. Hannah earlier, honored is the perfect word. Um, I'm excited to talk about such an important yet taboo topic um, with everyone here tonight. Um, like Scott said, I work at the One Love Foundation. I'm an engagement manager there. I've been there a little over three and a half years. Um, and I really do believe in the prevention work that we do. Um, I learned so much in this work, even in my grown adultness. Um, I'm learning how to have healthier relationships every day. Um, so I truly believe that there is space in this conversation, in this work for everyone to learn how to love better, to learn how to be healthier. Um, and it's honestly what motivates me to show up to be in this room tonight. So thank you for having me and I'm excited for the conversation. Thank you. And bringing up, but not the last one, the one who's always, I think his life has been nothing but working in this field and working, doing this work. Uh, from sun up to sundown, for no money, sometimes getting pennies, but he has a real love for this. And I tell you, it was if it wasn't for him and some of his, well, his him and his brother and many others out here in Queens that really had my back in many aspects of when I was working with PAL doing things and things that happening on the streets with the kids in the, in the community, this guy does it all. And he has the perfect title of his job that he does He's called chief of the streets. He's not in the office. He ain't worried about working in the office. He ain't wearing no tie like us. He's out there in them streets doing the work. He also is part of life camp with Erica Ford. Let me introduce my main man, my bro, who's out there in the streets doing the work when we in the office, A.U. Hogan. <laughs> yeah, I try to spend some time. Thanks so much for that, Scott. Um, 
when I when I do my next thing, you're gonna introduce me, brother. That was that was that was beautiful. <laughs> and and, and I, I'm I'm gonna let Q go last because remember Q said a long, long, long time. So that means I've been here for a long time. And and and, and what happened? We just started very early because you knew the conditions of Southeast Queens. You know, back then, you know, during the, the crack the crack era. And one of the interesting things that there was a lot of uh, male on women violence back then, even the male in, on women violence where men would would uh, sell this poison to the woman. And then eventually, you know, that would create a culture of acceptance of what we would do with our woman. And um, I, I'm not going to say anything about me. I'm going to sit down and listen, you know, and then add on. But I think we just got to be very cognizant of the images that we create of both men and women and the, and the standards that we desire for them to live up to, which most most of them are really, uh, really non-existent. You know, um, a quick story, 30 seconds. Uh, I was talking to 50 Cent, he's a younger brother, when that I was training when I was I had a training gym. I would leave Q&M at Roy Wilkins and go to my boxing gym when I retired. And, and so... Um, I'm on the phone with him. This is 2014. I'm on the phone with him. He's in L.A. He's in L.A. with, uh, uh, I think it was Eminem and uh, someone else. And they was he was asking somebody for a glass of water. And so they told him, he said, yo, if you ask, want a glass of water, just ask one of the bees over there. You know, and that was like the real accepted language that go ask the bee for water. And the next thing you know, 50 is drinking water. You know, and I, and I just think that, you know, we create the, the conditions, one in our home and our households, and also what we accept when we come out of households as men to make sure that our women are protected. That That is one of the first things that God gave us, you know, the ability to make sure our womb was safe. And we have failed that since the beginning of time. So perfect segue for me, uh, you and I really appreciate that because I want to I want everybody to dive down deep and we talk about intimate domestic violence, it doesn't always have to be male against women. Yes. It can be male on male, woman on woman. It's very different and different. But that domestic violence, how that intimate partner uh, violence that happens and how it spills over out into the community is another realm also. So first of all, let's break down. We talk about intimate domestic violence and you all the experts, Let's break that down so people really understand what we're talking about when we talk about intimate domestic violence. So, uh, Han, I'm going to throw it to you first. I, I just, I see you smiling. Like, I, I can see the wheels turning. So go ahead, Hannah. Yeah, I mean, so I'm going to, I am going to answer your question, Scott, but I'm going to say something broader, if that's okay. <laughs> Um, and it's not an advertisement for my office. It's actually something that I truly believe in, which is that when we're talking about these issues, we should be talking about it in the broadest of senses. And I say that partly because Melissa is here and Q and others who care a lot about prevention and a lot of what we can do as community members, as family members, as friends, um, as policymakers is to realize that if we think about the whole spectrum of domestic and gender-based violence, we'll, we will get further because they're all interconnected. And that's why we really spent a lot of time talking to City Hall and saying our office, which used to be the office to combat domestic violence, which to your point, Mike, not good language, <laughs> whoever came up with that, um, is now the office to end domestic and gender-based violence. And um, what we mean by that is domestic violence, which can include family violence, which can include um, intimate partner violence, which is really what your question was, which um, really can be any form of abuse that one intimate partner in a dating relationship, and it doesn't matter um, where you are, it doesn't matter what your gender identity is, what your gender, your sexuality is, it's one person in an intimate relationship using power and control and, and making the world of that other person smaller. That's the, the, the simplest I can break it down for you. And that can look so different. But those same dynamics are at play in sexual violence, in human trafficking, which can include sex trafficking and exploitation. It can be in dating violence that Nalicia talks about. It can be 
in elder abuse, like those same kinds of dynamics can play out. Um, and that's my really long winded way of saying that I think if we really want to make a difference, we should be like Melissa said, focusing how to have healthier relationships earlier and earlier, because those are protective factors against all that kind of victimization that can happen to all of us <laughs> throughout our lifetime. So that's my lofty goal, this almost last day of DVAM. Um, I hope that kind of answers the question. <laughs> Dr. Oliver, you want to add in on that? Yeah, as, as I think about it, among the things that I think about is the fact that sometimes violence that happens in schools, like bullying, influences how people feel about themselves and how they treat others. Violence that happens in the home, if there's violence in the home, uh, what happens is that sometimes they take it out on kids in school. And I also think peer groups are, are interesting because it shapes the way that you know, you told a story about 50 Cent and, uh, and what he was uh, told to, to how, how to respond. You know, I think that uh, among the things that happen is how we learn to uh, view women and to, to uh, see their role uh, influences how people behave towards women. And, um, uh, and sometimes you can behave very badly towards women based on what you think the rules are. And, you know, going to, you know, uh, spending some time in Africa and working in, in Africa and then looking at some of the things that we bring back to uh, 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 experience within the United States is that sometimes we look at role, the roles of men and the roles of women and, and uh, men end up having a perspective about uh, what they think being a leader is and being in charge is, is a problem in Africa. It's in different countries, 52 countries in Africa, but it's a problem in the United States, you know, in terms of how we uh, view women, value women, and behave towards women. So those are things that we have to sort of uh, re-examine and, uh, uh, and learn how to do better. And Dom, I, I wanted to throw it up to you also because, you know, I, I remember an article that someone sent me about uh, in the armed forces, how domestic violence plays out. And, and even from within your own, your own unit, how it plays out and how that falls out with, uh, with PSD and everything else that comes out with being in the military world. Uh, so, and I know you're an expert at it, so I'm throwing it to you, Dom. Yeah, the, the military has a, uh, another, it's a whole world in and of itself. And they handle domestic violence and sexual assault in a very unique way, in, in, in a way that uh, the um, civilian population does not. Um, when there is a domestic violence incident or a sexual assault incident, the, the commander uh, of that unit pretty much becomes the judge of whatever happens in that scenario. And that's why you see a lot of cases that are um, mishandled, uh, should I say, because these commanders, um, for what they are, they are experts in their arena, but they are not experts in domestic violence or, or sexual assault. And so um, a lot of cases will get overlooked simply because of the bias of the body that is governing that particular issue. And so um, that's why a lot of domestic violence and, and sexual assault has been brushed under the rug. Um, we see issues like what happened at Fort Hood um, which is a, a disaster. It was a complete disaster. They, there's one person dying after another. And it's because of the, uh, the, the thought process, the, uh, some of the belief systems that uh, from the old days, so to speak, where, oh, this is not a problem. This is not real. This is not an issue. And so recently, um, uh, one thing, the, uh, uh, I think it was uh, President Biden talked about this, about um, removing that power from the commanders and having a, uh, an independent uh, entity start to make these decisions about these cases in the military, because the military is a hyper-masculinized, uh, it's a hyper-masculine environment. And so it, they are taught, they are trained every day on how to shoot, how to kill, how to strategize. And so a lot, some of them bring their own traumas and then once you add that, that skill set, now you have a, a ticking time bomb at home and no one knows how to deal with that. So 
Uh, at the program I work for is called Family Advocacy. Uh, it's called FAP, and uh, each installation has a FAP. And so we work to try to prevent that, and then to, we also address it as well. But one of the biggest issues is, is having an outside entity come in and, and, and actually uh, look at what's going on and then help them to address that. Uh, the military has been kind of tight-lipped on that. They don't, they don't want public intervention, but it, it has reached a point, well, actually it's been reached a point where it's long overdue where this, this change is needed, is needed um, in the military. And so I'm doing my part, you know, and there's a, a hundreds of thousands of other, the rest of us trying to do our part to try to, uh, to, to change this dynamic, which um, with the new policies that are coming out, I, I'm encouraged by that. I'm glad to see that they're removing uh, this from the commanders. I do training with commanders every month. So I meet with them every month. There's new commanders that come in. I meet with them. And as I'm talking to them, a lot of them don't want that responsibility of having to, they don't want it themselves. So they're actually, a lot of them are actually welcoming the change that's going to happen. Well, Brother Ulesta, uh, so how does this play out with racism in this, in this realm also? Well, you know, when I think of, my, by the way, much of my focus is going to be on male intimate partner violence against women, because that's what the organization Men Stopping Violence, with um, whom I work, um, has been doing for, for the last 40 years or so. So, you know, when, when I think of male intimate partner violence against women, I think of uh, a society, you know, um, basically imposing some patriarchal ideals that, um, you know, many men in, in internalize this very destructive notion, ideas about what, what, what it means um, to be a man. And when it's interesting you're talking about the military, I, I think about that construct, that training about um, masculinity, destructive masculinity, that much of it, for example, includes um, um, not asking for help, um, denying your own, you know, feelings, access to your full range of feelings, you know, the use of power over and a whole lot of stuff. A lot of that training, by the way, is a lot of preparation, you know, for, in, in my view and others, sort of going to war. And if it's not in Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever, it's in the living room, the bathrooms of a, you know, of a home where that kind of training um, men oftentimes enact. The way I see racism, racism comes in is in, in this very racist culture so often, for example, um, black men have been seen as the embodiment of, of what violence looks like, right? And so often whenever there are acts of violence committed by white men particularly it doesn't get the same kind of scrutiny or, you know, that it would if it's a, a, a black or brown, brown, brown man. And frankly speaking, when you look at the issue of violence, not in, even in the home and beyond, for me, and I, 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 in a very raw way, I can't imagine more acts of violence committed than anyone other than white, more than white men. I mean, the, in terms of going to war, or the policies of destruction, name it, it is primarily white men in power making those decisions that not only impact us on those macro global levels, is also the kind of policy that make possible violence in an intimate partner uh, setting. So that's one way I, I think about how racism um, shows up. It's like, who is really committing acts of violence? Who really has power, you know, to make policy that, you know, allow for changes? Um, who right now talk about power at the, at the, 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 the level of, of, of Congress, um, decisions about um, what women can do with, with their own bodies or not. It's, it's primarily white men on the Supreme Court who are making those decisions. I mean, the list goes on and on. So just briefly, that's how I see um, the issue of racism intersecting when we talked about male violence against women. If, if I could just jump in there real quick. Um, Lester just really hit on a couple of really strong points that I'm like, wow, I'm just taking it in. I want to circle back to something that Hannah said with risk factors, right? Uh, and even Q mentioned it with um, behavior modeling now. I know that it really speaks to like the social learning theory and just what's that look like, you know, um, from, a from a therapeutic lens, that's really like the modeling that you want the clients to have for learned behaviors to remove negative behaviors. And I say that to say, I want to circle back to Hannah based off some of the stuff that we heard already, like 
what would be some great uh, behavioral modeling techniques, or if not just risk factors that can cause this from a global level? Because one thing I know, um, violence across the board um, really speaks to a certain level of trauma or a lack of resources that can enhance that level of trauma, right? And so I want to bounce that off you and just get some of your thoughts before we spring it over to everyone else. Yeah, a lot of different ways I could talk about that. I mean, from a really early prevention standpoint, I think um, uh, being willing to talk to young people about what makes a healthy relationship, which often people push back on that, um, parents in particular, because they don't want educators talking to their kids about consent or boundaries or bodily autonomy, unless it's about stranger danger, which is really not the thing that is as prevalent as the thing we're talking about tonight, right? So unless it has to do with that scenario. So I think being able to um, create young people, and I don't want it to be just about like young women and creating protective factors for them. And I actually, I also have two teenage daughters and I have a lot that's going on in my household right now. Um, I think we need to think about it across genders, but also about how we are creating um, people who won't use that, um, exactly, Mike, <laughs> use that power in the future or think that's appropriate and that they will respect people's boundaries, as simple as that sounds, that makes a huge difference. Um, and then I guess jumping totally ahead to a lot of work that is done by people way more expert than me on this panel, um, is, is also completely recognizing what you said, Jerry, about, and I can't remember who said it, but whoever said it, I wrote it down, that it's not just about accountability, it's also about healing, because, you know, hurt people hurt people, um, but also we all hurt people in some way, <laughs> so seeing everybody as a human being, and I think that some of the shifts in the way that we do our work, and Thank you to organizations like Men Stopping Violence that have been doing this work for a long time and really seeing your clients as people who need to be held accountable, but also need to be treated like human beings who can change, um, have experienced harm themselves um, and allowing them the space to heal to create the kind of change that, um, that we're talking about. I want to jump in real quick, and uh, I appreciate what you said, Hannah. I'm stuck on a couple of things uh, in a good way, like ruminating on them. You know, one is when Scott asked that question, you, Lester, uh, I feel like uh, our entire conversation elevated to a, to a level. And some of the things that Dominique said, I'm kind of braiding those things, and I'm thinking about power. So I know Scott was asking a question wise question about, about violence and racism. And in a lot of what I heard from what Dominique said, what Ulessa said, and some of the things other people have said, it's got my mind swirling with how violence can be sanctioned in ways or excused in other ways and vilified uh, or, or, or hyper-focused on in, in, in other ways. And, and real short anecdote, I was talking to uh, someone in my network who's very conservative and he shared with me Yes, I know such persons. And he shared with me a video of um, Chinese military, Russian military, US military, and different propaganda. So much of the Chinese military was guys doing backbreaking exercises and having glass plates on their chest and someone comes with a hammer and smashes them and a, and a gallery of, of older Chinese officials applauding that. And the Russian military was the same kind of thing, sweating and exercising and da 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 And interspersed with this, but the American military was a story, I don't remember, I think it, one was a enlisted woman by the name of Sarah. And it was Sarah and two mommies and why she had decided to join the military. And People can receive that same information in very different ways. I thought it was very empowering in terms of what it was saying about choices American uh, service persons make. And it also, at the same time, I can say it plays into his narrative about America must be weak because we're not emphasizing strength. We're not emphasizing this willingness to mm -hmm. fight and to die and to kill and to blah, blah, and the other kind of thing. And I also think there's a lot of 
uh, thinly veiled subtext around the fact that women were in the video and how the women in the video are being used. But what Dom was hitting me with and what I was hearing is these things are going to play out depending on who is asked to commit acts of violence, who's being trained that they may have to engage in acts of violence, who's being excused later on. You know, uh, it, and I think it goes without saying, Dom, you can train people, uh, it, and I don't want to pick on the military, but just as an example, you can train people to go off to fight a war, but who does the training about how to behave in what you let's say in the kitchen or the bathroom? That's not the war front. That's not the war ground. So I want to get some of the folks that didn't have a chance to weigh in a minute. I'm going to steer that question to, to Q first and open it up to others. Like, how do we unpack the, the, the power and the powerful who are sort of instilling some of these messages of how we interpret what violence is sanctioned or more or less acceptable depending on who's performing it? I think that's going to help us on our road to thinking about bystander roles if we understand like who's kind of writing this code in the background. Yeah, I think it's um, let's go great, great question. It's a it's a dissertation question actually, but um, I'll, I'll jump into it. But I think it's um, I think it's too one to to hand his point about you know understanding what we talk about intimate partner violence or gender violence, ultimately gender violence, but when you look at interpersonal violence, right? That's how we're approaching this work. I think that's where AU's work comes in right now when you think about uh, gun violence prevention work. I think at the, at the very core of what we're talking about of this intimate violence is power and control, right? And it's about the gaining and the maintaining of it, right? When I talk to young people, I talk about that is the strategy. They play video games. The strategy is to win, but the strategy is to gain or maintain power and control and using all those other types and methods and types of abuse and tactics as the tactics to getting towards the strategy, right? So I think it's important that we kind of look at power and is power is not a terrible thing, right? If you look at power along with privilege and entitlement, I think that's, you know, all the, the combinations that we're talking about. And we're talking about how we're, in, in, in regards to what Ulysses was talking about, men's violence against women, talking about how men are socialized, so important, right? Socialized, and it's not just about uh, the machismo and the hyper-masculinity, which, you know, uh, the military definitely represents, but you don't need military to learn that, right? We, we, we picked that up in our communities, how we're raised to be, uh, you know, uh, young men and young women, how we kind of view the world in that way. But I think it's really important to kind of really break down how power works and how it shows up. And that's where we have those conversations, right? And I think the, the power of a barbershop when I was doing that work was that your barber or your beautician was like your bartender, right? They had, you come to them with questions, even if you ask them or not, the environment is gonna inform you, right? So when I was a young kid, my mother would bring my brother myself to a barbershop and leave us there and go go about her other work and things to do so the barbershop was the, the barber was in control right and he would say hey young man how do women treat you and we're like four and five years old we don't know even know how to answer that that question but we come up with something right but that was about setting the tone about um your masculinity to recognize that you have power as a male to recognize that we have certain entitlements and, and privileges that are very invisible. We don't even, you know, we don't realize that we have them. But when we do notice them, what do we do with that? So I think, you know, that, that power, privilege, entitlement, all of those things have to be factors. And I just wanted to add the thing about race. You know, race is a factor completely. And my work has always been on the intersection of race and gender. So the other part about race that comes into domestic violence is that, what type of help or resources available to you based on your socioeconomic background, your racial background, and how you're perceived amongst systems, right? So a lot, a lot, a lot of the pushback around domestic violence and this work engaging men, particularly men of color and black men, is our relationship to systems. And when we are, you know, confronted with domestic violence, are we confronted in the same ways as our white counterparts will be? Are we uh, confronted in the same ways of, 
you know, um, poor, poor folks or indigenous folks or queer folks or and so, so it's like the factors around race um, don't exist by themselves. Gender does not exist by themselves. Class doesn't exist by themselves. So it's really about a question of what type of resources are available to you. And when we think about domestic violence, at least here in New York City, I've done work globally as well, different countries in Africa, uh, South America, the whole thing, right? When we think about this issue of uh, power, lack of power within uh, gender violence, domestic violence, we think about black folks, brown folks, poor folks, they become the face of this issue that we're talking about because that's what we see in the news. That's what we see in the courtrooms. That's what we see in the police stations. And you know, so race is a factor in all of that in terms of how, to, how do we get the help that we need and the appropriate needs around that. And looking at, you know, we're talking about bystander intervention, but we have to be about prevention. If we do this thing about around prevention properly, we will need less direct services. And I'm going to say, I want to put direct services out of business through my work. Yeah, no, that's and that's right. not, a, not to say it's not needed. It's necessary. Absolutely. But at the same time, instead of just getting somebody a bed, a shelter, and a home, let's, let's rip that Band-Aid off and look at the root causes and heal, right? We talked about the trauma piece and the healing that's necessary. That's so, so important. And power, power is profitable. Violence against women is profitable. Mm -hmm. Violence against black and brown people is profitable. Violence against poor people is profitable. So we have to kind of look at how these things kind of all are connected in a broader sense, like Hannah was talking about. One last thing and I'll shut up. When I first started doing this work, domestic violence meant to me was violence in the United States. So mm -hmm. I understood domestic violence to be violence within the United States borders. And that international violence was violence overseas. But so I learned that we're talking about on a very micro level, a relationship, a community, but in the very essence and what was the same was that power and control was at the core of it. So that, that is the ultimate work that we have to kind of look at and explain and be creative around. How do we interrupt that and change attitudes and belief systems? I'll be quiet. Ooh, Q, Q drop some bombs right there. I, you actually tricked me. I want to I give this to Lester, but I got I to share something. When we talk about like the perception and the narrative of that perception, I can't help but think of, and again, a lot of this stuff is circumstantial because I know they're still investigating, but I think of the Gabby Petito case, right? And like Laudry, uh, I believe his name is La Laudry. He came home. I just want y'all to understand, like this is for the family, the barbershop. He came home, spent a couple of days, and then his family sent them out. And God knows what happened. I'm going to leave that for the police to tell. But I know if that was a person of color and everyone's asked that question in their own head, he's not making it home. You know what I'm saying? And I remember growing up, just the perception of violence, because you knew if anything, if law enforcement was called, um, who knows what would happen. So everyone just kept quiet and you kept it as a, as a cultural silence thing. And so um, when we mentioned behavior modeling and we, when we talk about like bystander intervention, as specifically for the culture, specifically for uh, the black and brown community. What does that look like? Because it's so ingrained as, oh, that's just color. They just having an argument. They just having a conversation when it's like, no, this is like generational trauma that we're just leading off. So, I mean, I want to, Dom, thank you for everything. But I want to pass this to, um, if I say your name wrong, please forgive me, Natalie, N N Nalicia? Lisa. There we go. I knew I was close. I knew I was close. Um, Nalisha. Walk, Nalisha, uh, walk me through that because... It's so real when it, when we talk about the culture and black and brown communities. Um, okay, where should I start? I think that there, I love that you brought up the Gabby case because that's actually what I was sitting here thinking of because um, there were a few things that you said, Q, about you know folks in black and brown communities not really getting or being perceived this as this one story, um, this one story of violence and we're always on the news and whatever it is. Um, and then I think about things like the Gabby Petito case, and I'm like, wow, that is, that's just so interesting that um, there is all of this attention being shown to this young woman. And I've been, I've been in this work for about three and a half years now, and I'm always looking at the current events, and I don't actually see that. I'm always looking. I'm looking for the thing that I hear about the school that I'm working with in Brooklyn, what the students have told me about losing someone in that community, just a few, you know, a few minutes away from me. Um, and I think that there 
is something in this conversation. There's an element of the systems that you're talking about, the structures that are in place um, that are like intentionally set up um, to make us seem one type of way. And I think that when folks thought of, even at One Love, at One Love we made this, this big announcement that the Gabby Petito case was out and this is something that we wanted to comment on. But I think interrupting change is even thinking about um, the systems and structures that are in place that get Gabby's um, article on the news in the first place before we even get to thinking about, okay, if, Black, if Brian Landry was a Black man, yes, he would not have made it home. And we know that for sure. Um, but why is that? And I think unless we start teaching young people to talk about why that is and to understand the root mm -hmm. of some of these systems and structures, then we're just going in circles and that generational trauma isn't going to go anywhere. <clears throat> so I think all of that to say that the generational trauma, yes, it's there. Um, a lot of it is like learned behavior, but it's also can't be a reason that we do the things that we engage in violence and abuse in our communities, um, especially if it is something that we are all dealing with. And so I think there, yes, there's an element of learned behavior, of generational trauma, um, of things being normalized to you. But at some point, um, there's an opportunity for you to say, this is what has been the norm to me, but now this is what I'm gonna choose for myself. And I don't think that happens for young people unless they have adults um, in their lives or even young people around them who are stigmatizing some of these things that we see, calling out unhealthy behaviors, creating a context where a young person, a young black man can talk about feeling jealous, can talk about feeling depressed, can talk about feeling anxious. Um, I think that uh, at one of our strategy is to empower young people to have these conversations and not just conversations about relationships, but but about um, the root of these behaviors that we do. And maybe there's a place in that conversation for systems too. We don't only have interpersonal relationships. And I, I like that you brought that up, Q. We have relationships with systems. When you're in school and you're in a mixed school and you're you're getting hardly or more more harshly um, uh, treated than your white peers and you're a young black man and, and you're on this pipeline to prison, um, I think there's something to be spoken about there too. And so all of that to say, I, I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent. I admire our young people. I think that they are the answer to, to solving this problem. I think that empowering them to change the statistics through conversation, through when you do see, when you are on the subway and you see that happening, what do you do? What do you say? Do you just walk away? Do you walk away and you do something? Do you talk to the person next to you? Is there some type of stigma in your stomach? Is there some type of gut feeling when you see that going on to do something? And I don't think right now that that is like a group norm in our, in our community, in our black and brown communities. I think it's more of the norm to look away or say, you know, I'm just gonna comment. I'm just gonna say y'all are smiling on the TL instead of, you know, taking a second to say, wait, my stomach's feeling weird. And that same gut feeling you would have about seeing something terrible in the news, we want young people to have that gut feeling when they see that arguing on the subway as well. And so I think that there is just, um, as it pertains to racism, homophobia, transphobia, all of the isms, ableism, I don't think that young people um, are gonna feel empowered to actually work towards changing those statistics unless we teach them how to interrupt those things are, that are at the very bottom of this pyramid of violence. At the very bottom, it's microaggressions, it's stereotypes, it's gender-based stereotypes. Um, before even anything even gets to abuse, there are these conversation and these norms um, that are deeply rooted in our communities. Yes, maybe because of generational cycles of trauma, but maybe because of so much more too. So um, I'm just, all of that to say I'm empowered being in this space because we are starting these conversations with young people and they're not easy conversations, but I think that we can't just sit on the outside and talk about racism and talk about homophobia, and transphobia. We have to have these conversations with young people because they're the ones who are gonna make the change. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop there. I'd like to build on that. I really appreciate what you just said, uh, Nalisha. Uh, if one message I would wanna leave with today, right? It would be this, there is such an investment in, in society wanting to make the issue of intimate partner violence, whatever form it may take, same sex, same gender relations, and so on and so on. But again, I'm gonna focus on male, male intimate partner violence against women to, to really insist that we think about it as a problem of, in, you know, of individual men, you know, a few 
guys who've gone astray, gone bad, and we just need to round them up and fix these men and send them back into their homes and everything would be all right. To Q's point earlier about getting these intervention program out of business, it's, it's just a handful of men. Of all of the men who are assaulting women in the many ways in which we as men do, just name it, most of those men will never see any kind of intervention, any kind of treatment. It's just a small percentage. I don't know anything empirical to get to cite a specific um, number of men. I'm not aware of any, maybe someone could speak to that. But I, know, I, I hear enough to would suggest it would be probably less than 10%. So if most of the, the, you know, the violence against women, men's acts of violence against women are by individuals who never see any intervention, any kind of treatment, then what are we doing? And what we're learning over the years from, from men is, Hey, basically, we understand we can get away with it for the most part. That's the primary one of the primary reasons. Yes, there's been a lot of gains and there's accountability, men are being held accountable. Talking about race again, we know the overrepresentation of policing of black and brown communities. And of course, you know, men of color get arrest, arrested, you know, at high numbers um, in terms of proportion to the broader population. So I just want to challenge myself and us to, and, and folks who are listening out there to really resist this part of the American culture to want to frame problems as one of individuals. You know, hey, you all your successes, your failures, your challenges, it's all about you and you just get your act together and everything will be fine. No, we've got patriarchy, white supremacy, just name it that is constantly to, to Alicia's point, you're just con continually imposing. And I know we're gonna talk about trauma, but just a quick piece around that. So, you know, we have our traditional definition about what trauma is. But one of the things if you talk to clinicians, I think oftentimes get, get ignored when thinking about trauma is these traumatic inducive conditions called white supremacy and racism that just um, bear in this, this violence on the bodies of black and brown folks and then women and so on and so on. If we're gonna end it, talk about prevention, we have to go after those systems, those institutions as yes, we create spaces where men can do healing work. I'm not saying get rid of that. That is essential that we have spaces where men can come together and work to do this kind of transformative work, but not at the expense of our, our supporting society's insistent that the, the, the focus be there and take our eyes off of the real problem, which is structural inequality and all that um, both Hannah and Q talked about. It's a trap, man. Hey, just tell me about those few bad guys over there, you know? How would you, you know, do with that? I, I think it's a little bit more widespread than just a few. And, and another thing that I think, too, is that there are things that we talk about, but there are things that we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. So there's a uh, situation where I was in one part of the country, and the program was really good. I really liked the way that they handle addressing uh, intimate partner violence. But there was a, a guy that came in that talked about the fact that before he came into the group, he was dealing with police stopping him and oh, harassing him. Absolutely. And as he was having conversations about that, there was nothing that was directed towards him and problem solving. There was, there was no discussion about how his uh, feelings and behavior about police harassment influenced what happened, what he did when he got home. So uh, the thing that happened was that, uh, and, and the process of, of the things that they were doing around domestic violence, I thought were excellent. But another element when you talk about race uh, is the context in which we live. And if we don't talk about that, for example, how did you feel when you went, went through that experience? I felt powerless. I felt like I didn't have a, a, a resource to be able to, reach out to, I didn't feel as though, um, uh, I felt helpless. And then to be able to talk to him and problem solve with him about things that he might be able to do to address that. But the other thing to link it to domestic violence is, so you felt powerless, you felt helpless, you felt uh, uh, out of control. And then to say to him, how do you think she feels when you beat her? Mm -hmm. There's a connection between both things, but there are things that we, or, you know, in, in the past, we didn't talk about faith. You know, uh, in, in, the, in the old times, when I was starting out, uh, you know, we're, the people would say, if somebody brought something up, 
we're not here to talk about that. But the thing that's so interesting to me is the fact that when you look at the, the ways that faith or misinterpretations of faith influence how people uh, behave and think about things, but endorse violence towards women. And you've got to be able to understand it to be able to confront it. And so there, there are things that we don't do, things, conversations that we don't have, that we need to have in terms of having people be able to problem solve, to come up with strategies and knowing how to do, but link those, uh, those uh, feelings and that, that, those behavior, the behaviors that men do in reaction. Uh, and that they're gonna find, men who better gonna find different ways to be abusive to their partners. But one thing is that you've gotta look at the whole uh, ball of wax and be able to help people learn how to problem solve to be able to address one set of challenge but don't put it on her. Don't take the response, the, the issue about uh, whatever you're dealing as a rationale that justifies your behavior towards, uh, negative behavior towards your partner. So. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in for a second. I love what you're talking about. I, I can't say how much I agree with it. And I think of myself as someone who actually before I did this kind of work, I worked with survivors. So I actually, I, I that's why I always feel um, like I want someone who actually does abuse partner intervention work <laughs> to be with me when I'm doing this. Cause I sometimes feel like I don't have the real meat, but I can tell you that the same thing plays out as advocates. And it's a good way, Jerry, to bring in that link I mentioned in the chat that was work that younger, more brilliant colleagues that I supervise uh, push forward in our office to really talk about something else, which is survivors who survivors of color not getting the same responses or getting violent responses or being arrested. Um, and so, but I'm I'm gonna link it to that, I swear. But my point was gonna be that I'm I think it really is about the big picture. Um, of how we're changing society, but also in our individual work. So if I'd had the tools as an advocate for survivors when I was a young lawyer to actually do what you're saying and think about my clients in a more holistic way and think about what their life experiences meant to them as survivors and not just to come at it as a person who was gonna save the day, I would have done, my mom gets mad when I say things like this because she's like, you were doing good work. And I'm like, mom, I'm not saying I wasn't doing good work. I'm saying that I could have done better work. And that's why I think when we're talking about how we're gonna prevent people from causing harm or from being harmed and taking care of themselves, it's all about talking to young people so that they, I'm jealous of my kids sometimes at the tools they're getting in certain spaces to and how they're gonna respond to the world. Um, so that no matter what they're doing, like forget about gender-based violence, no matter how they're interacting with people, they have that deeper understanding of where people, of the, of the, all the work that's still left to be done. And that can be overwhelming, but also you can do it in the moment. You can, you can acknowledge that and, and you can do better in the moment. I hope that makes some sense. <laughs> it makes sense to me that the thing I think about is, um, the woman that did the Hurt Locker, uh, I can't think of her name. She also did a movie called Detroit. And uh, Detroit looked at the violence that happened to, uh, you know, to within the city of Detroit. I happened to be a child growing up in the city of Detroit during the riot. And so, and the, but I live in, in Minnesota. I live in the Twin Cities and I see what happened to George Floyd. And the, you know, people have been talking about, my brother was harassed, my cousin was harassed. I, I've been harassed by the police, but nobody wanted to talk about how to address that issue. And I think the same thing with regard to George Floyd, you had things in front of you showing you what was going on. Now the racism to me deals with the fact that we haven't been able to talk about that type of thing. But if you look at what happened in Detroit, in the movie Detroit, and what happened at the end of it uh, with the policemen are things that have happened historically. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about qualified immunity, 
when you talk about uh, uh, people colluding to be supportive of uh, the perpetrators. And I, I think you can tie that to men who batter, you know, in terms of looking at how we maybe uh, sometimes collude and support and things that, and we don't problem solve and help to address the issue. One of the things that I appreciate about Keith Ellison, who's actually from the city of Detroit, but he's, he's younger than me, uh, is, is the fact that he identified those things that would interrupt finding justice. And he just addressed it. And he didn't allow those things to influence judgment for somebody that committed a crime. And uh, uh, King Chauvin was a person that ended up trying to get away with it. And he's still trying to figure out how to get the, uh, uh, the, the county to pro provide support to him for his defense. Can I, can, I, can I get AU to jump in? Because some things you're talking about is stuff that he does on a daily basis. Who's that? AU. Okay. Yeah, AU, I, you there? Yeah, yeah, I, I was just learning. I, I learn on a daily basis, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, it's amazing. There's so much, you know, on one of the things, everybody, I'm just to bounce real quick um, about when we're talking about how do we, about prevention. Um, prevention it, it covers a whole lot of areas about what we're dealing with right now. Often when I speak or we end in uh, sessions, you know, the people who don't get it, I say, welcome, violence, uh, welcome, coming to a theater near you. Because a lot of times in some areas, they believe that violence is never going to come there. If you look at the prices of real estate in certain areas in the city, as opposed to other areas, you got a million dollars, million dollar homes where it's, there's, a minimal amount of violence, and then you pay this 800000 more, you can get away from the violence, you know, And but people don't know that violence spreads. And it's something that becomes addictive to the individual that one that suffers from it because he suffers trauma, and also the person that gives it. They're suffering the trauma. I want to speak quickly on uh, uh, the racist race thing, and I, I always understood it that there's really no such thing as white privilege. And I want y'all to hold that for a minute. There's something that's called that's perceived white privilege, because there's a difference of the example when Trump was running for office, you had a lot of white people voting for Trump because they thought they were for him. But Trump was definitely was for the conservatives and definitely wasn't for poor, poor white people. But because they uh, were white, they believe that they had a certain amount of privilege. And the privilege is shown in a, in a, in a, in a sense to black people because of the stories that are told to them that, you know, your history in, was entailed of a few uh, white men that did a few bad things, but they had to look after bad people and the black bad people were the slaves. And so when you, when you frame it in that, in that sense and people don't understand that the stories that we tell young people, we live on it because my whole career in school was me reading about how do we come out of slavery? very minimal stuff about how it was like maybe one paragraph of what it took for them to go agree to us to be brought over here. They ain't going there and snatch nobody up. There was agreement. You know, there was, there was exchanges. They gave us up and we eventually came here. There was finances. Who financed us? The people that financed that racism and financed that uh, uh, chattel slavery are benefactors today. And you can go see them ones living in two million, three million dollar houses. And those conversations have to be really talked about. To deal with the prevention, I'm going to go here and go deal with the prevention in the family. We have to really give, really look at different agencies, you know, and, and Scott, I'm going to say this for you and, you know, and you are aware, um, the Agency for Child Services. Okay, and, that, and that, that slavery that's happening there, you know, and so if we don't really talk and address those issues and go look at the birth parent, give them resources because we'll have someone that might not even be, in, someone got thrown into uh, services last week because the, the kid had a rash and the doctor perceived that it was, must have been two weeks since that rash was treated. The parent didn't know it was a rash, the person didn't know that it, but they brought the child into services. And so now they gotta go fight for this kid. So what happened, slavery just has become a more 
um, articulate way of bringing your children into a system. And so when you look at that and the timing of the pandemic and the vaccine, firing of teachers, firing of the city workers, no one's really suffering. You can get other jobs and money, but the children are the ones that suffer because they built and have relationships with these teachers and the children, they don't know how to navigate from trauma. So they're gonna start being violent to one another. So you're gonna see a tick up and what this, the first thing the mayor had, had us do and had and, and talk to the chief of the department and ask life camp, well, what are we gonna do? So they gave another budget for us to work in other schools. Cause we, we was doing 10 years ago, we were doing uh, 10 block area. Then we became uh, three precincts, 105, 103, 113. Now we're doing the whole Queens and also being an influence to the Bronx and Brooklyn because of the heavy violence that's in there. And so, although we welcome the work because we want to change mindsets and behaviors, what about the systems that are setting these things up? When you know these young children who were out of school for a whole year and then you go, they go see their teachers, this is purpose. They meet their teachers for two months. And then the teacher, you say the teachers can't, and I, I'm, I'm all for safety. I don't want to get into the vaccine discussion, but I'm just saying, what is the timing that these kids meet their teachers for 65 days and a lot of these teachers are not going to be there. And so now you've got children that already had trouble at home, came to school to meet that, that educated, that made them feel welcome for like seven to eight hours. And now on their way home, they're trying to buy and, and join something that can combat that pain, that can combat that trauma, and that's gangs. And these, you know, we had the 13 year old shoot the kid last month in the knee with, to another 13 year old kid, the 14 year old kid that shot the 60 year old kid, the 60 year old kid that just killed his mother shooting him in the back. And the other, I mean, these things that I deal with, like you said, Scott, I deal with these things daily. And what happens is that we have been addressing the systems that's creating them, but then we need, we, need, we need educators, we need therapists, and we need people in other walks to really train the families while we're trying to make sure they're protected. And that comes with resource. You see the, the safest uh, communities is communities with a high level of resource. You see the dangerous communities, the, high, the low le level of resource. Like when even the PL that you came in, it's my last sentence. The PAL that came, thank Scott, I want to thank you for that because you came in and helped save the community because the person that you are. But they put a uh, they put a police athletic league in a community that Scott, after you left, didn't allow the people who lived in the community into the building. And that's until this day. So what about the trauma of those communities that happened? That happens in a lot of places with a with a with a with a recreation center is community based place, but it's not community based. So there's a lot of fights that we have to have right now. There's a lot of, we have to, we, we have to come, the people, the barbershop, the, we have to really start trusting and believing one another that we want these change. We have different ideas and different ways to get to it, but we have to team up and have to be a collective strategy to make sure this stuff really happens, that we save the people before they're young, while the mother's even thinking about having a child. And that's, we're not doing that. We're waiting, these kids, believe me, sis, Yesterday, stuff that went over in 111 and stuff yesterday afternoon from four o'clock to eight o'clock, these kids is nine, 10 years old. So we don't even consider them young people. We consider them as babies. So young people, we talking about so far as the system, 14 to 24. And what is it? What is that dynamic about 14 to 24? 14 years old in the hood, a man is grown. 24 years old, a man is old. You know, so it's just a lot of fighting we got to do. And we got to come together and make this fight. I, like I said, I was, I was listening because I like learning. And I want to see who I'm going to connect with, which is everybody, you know, to make sure this happens. You can see the work I do and help me do it. And I can see the work that you do and I'll help y'all do it. So it I'm sounds like we have a lot of, too. we have no, a lot of work. Go, go Scott, sorry. I was say we have a lot of work to do around trauma. And, and I guess we have years of being traumatized in our community. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm getting it correctly, because the trauma, it may start at home, but with the young people, they keep, uh, growing the trauma or preparing the trauma of what they see. So I guess if we get some of the root to it, I'm going to get to you, Q. I see you out there. Uh, I want to make sure, are we starting at the wrong age? We have to start at the babies and start the healing ne process? Neonatal, so neonatal. Come on, man. It got to be in the womb, man. In the, the womb, womb, we have to start. Yes, okay. man. In the womb of the man's mind. 
okay, because he's the one that's dealing with this this child on the way, dealing with this woman that he has to protect and make sure that he's safe, you know. And then we then you can deal with other things that the gender, the same gender bias, bias, and all those other things. But the beginning of you looking at a sister or looking at a woman and say, I want her to be a part of me. You have to develop inside your mind that you make sure that she's going to be safe. You're thinking about raising that child if that happens. And it should be if that happens. It should be a plan of that happening. But a lot of times, you know, these it's oops as opposed to a purpose in our communities. And then if it's oops, then, yo, dude don't got to care about nothing. And let's, you know, so we're not going to get into black father responsibility. I'm not going to get into that today because that's another conversation, you know. Thank you. Thank you. But, but uh, Scott, just on a trauma piece real quick. Trauma works in both directions. It's passed down and it's created from a, a relationship or an experience or what a community experience is. Highest form of uh, trauma that is created when a system fails you because you're seeking Ooh. justice, you're seeking accountability. And that's like the highest form of trauma that we can experience because we are also socialized to see that, you know, system is a way for me to get accountability and justice and it fails us so many different times but i wanted to say one thing and i think and i just want to kind of take advantage of the of the of the, the folks we have on this on this call um something I, I run this round table many of you all know i've been running it for over 11 years and i'm doing it weekly now post covid because of covid we're doing it weekly now and the questions i think we're all talking about what AU mentioned and what uh and you lester when you talked about you know, race and systems and, and Hannah as well. It's like, if, if we're really talking about the populations that I think most of us are serving or are, 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 um, folks of color, my work is with families and men, women, children. But like one, one thing that's important is this men's work. And it's like the issues around how race and gender comes up again, right? And, and we know this from the field of gender violence. When we talk about gender violence and domestic violence, the first thing we think about is women. And, if, and when we talk about race, we think about men and black men, rightfully so for both, right? But it's not, it's not complete. So the idea that, you know, we have to address both of these things. You know, we talk about Chappelle, we talk about all these other figures where race comes up when we're talking about uh, violence against women and girls, whatever capacity, physical, emotional, psychological, traumatic experiences. And what we tend to do is when we kind of look at what accountability could look like, and accountability is not a bad thing. It's about growth and a challenge and, and being better and having other people kind of hold us to account. And I think that's what we need, particularly as men, is like the, the issue that whenever we, we, we're about to address this issue of harm against women, we bring in race. And, that, and then race becomes the dominant conversation or well, lack of a better word, trumps the whole issue around the violence that happens towards women. So it becomes this larger issue around race. And we, and we, and we fail to realize that. And hey, you, you know this from the work, right? We think about gun violence. We always think about young men that, you know, young women and girls are impacted by gun violence from being, receiving the harm and doing the harm as much as men are, probably equally and even more so. But we kind of focus in on you know, black men and the issue of racism, and we invisibilize the issue of the violence that's happening towards uh, women and girls. Like, so I mean, like, and I think somebody mentioned timing, and you might have talked about timing. And I think both things need to be done, but we have to kind of look at the timing of it, right? That we can't just automatically talk about women's experiences and hearing their voices, but then just, just silence it when we talk about race as the greater issue. So, right. Q, so Q, I guess it's good. So as society, do we unconsciously we're hurting women because we're always talking to them about how they look, their body shapes, their 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 what they should be doing. And but our society puts a lot of pressure on women also to have this standard or, or what they should be looking like or what they should be modeling after. Would you say that's also a way that we traumatize women? Of course, of course. I think um, uh, Oliver, you listen, talked about, or maybe even um, Jerry talked about that picture. I remember, and this is just the latest picture of Trump, his cabinet, um, a bunch of white men, maybe one white woman making a decision about black bodies and, and women's bodies, right? That in itself is one thing that we have to kind of look at 
and think about like, damn, we're making those decisions. But I think, um, um, yeah, that's, that's part of it. Right. But like, we have to really think about who is controlling and making decisions about other people's bodies. Like I said, violence against women is profitable. Though that pick those men in those picture tell you who profits from that, who makes the decisions from that. Violence against uh, poor people and black and brown folks is profitable in some form or some fashion. And where AU was going with around property and values, like I will make sure that South Jamaica Queens is going to be a violent place. I'm going to divest in that community and make sure there's lack of resources so that I can initiate the points of gentrification. And then it's going to be more valuable to protect those uh, communities after a while. But yes, so that comes down to race again. But we have to really kind of look at what is it about us having holding two conversations at one time? Yeah. We can do more than one thing, mm-hmm. right? And we can't like prioritize when we think about it. We ultimately pro- pro- prioritize the experiences and the harm done to men over the harm done to women, and not only by systems and, and, and p- p- people in positions of power, but ourselves as a black and brown poor communities as well. Like we experience this. And we go home and take it out on our loved ones. And they also experience systemic and structural violence as well. So how do we hold all of this? I think that's going to be a fundamental question is that we can't, like, like hey, you mentioned, we have to look and link all these forms of violence because at the core of it is that power and control piece again, right? If we can link all these forms of violence, you know, solving one will make a whole hell of a, 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 an impact on solving the other forms that are closely Related to it, so violence. Okay. Can I bring Dom back into violence. this conversation? I, I, Dom, I, oh, Dom, go ahead. Go ahead, Dom. Because I haven't heard from Dom lately. Dom, come on, give me a piece on it. Give me your thoughts on this. You're muted. You're muted, Dom. You're muted. Dom, you're muted. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> no, I was saying. Uh, so the it, the the question kind of went out. So could you repeat that? Uh, Good, Q. Throw it out again, Q. I was just talking about like the uh, the issues of race and gender and how race tends to particularly right in a moment when we're trying to address this issue of harm done to women, like it, it drowns out the conversation and it becomes towards men uh, primarily. And it is an issue that needs to be dealt with. It's not like it doesn't exist, but we always the timing is always off and we never get to the to the poor, the principal contradiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I did. I did hear that part. And I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And, you know, I, I see this as as a, you know, a, um, a medical issue. If there's a medical issue, you know, um, and someone is seeing and someone shows up in the emergency room, um, there are different doctors that are going to handle the different issues. And that's what we're dealing with here. Racism is an issue and, and we need a doctor to handle that. But we'd also need someone that's, that's a specialist in, in violence against women. And so we can just simply handle that part without having to, like, as you, as you talked about, not muddy the waters, but, you know, to, to just, uh, that issue of racism is over encompassing. Like that is so huge. We can just talk about that forever without having to touch any uh, issues on, on violence against women. I, I think it, you know, it's something that needs to be uh, 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 a specialized focus to, you know, if we're having that conversation, you know, just to, to be intentional about making sure that we stay in that in that realm because I this comes up all the time it comes up all the time and um, but I, I think the intentionality of it I, I think is is a, a place for us to 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 focus ourselves because um, when we're talking about violence against women it, it it's really important I, I feel like it's it's a disservice to that issue to continue to spread and spread and spread and spread and, and get to this macro level um, uh, when we when we should be staying uh, on task with, you know, specifically with violence against women, because there are so many arenas within that title itself, violence against women, we can stay right there and we'll have enough, we'll have enough to, to carry us until the end of time. But um, I think that intention Intentionality is really important when it comes to this, because um, when you talk about the intersectionality that's happening right now of all of these issues, it's easy to just start here and then go there and go there and go there. But 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 I, I in, in a lot of the uh, classes that that we teach, um, 
that's something that we, you know, we redirect our, our, you know, our, uh, the people that we're working with, like, well, let's, let's stay on, let's stay on task. Let's stay focused on this um, because this is an important issue. And um, I just think that if, if we're more intentional about that, I think that um, that's something that it, it, it will be a benefit for everyone. And it's, and I'll say this too, it's not a negative that we're talking about this. I don't want to make it seem like that. It's not a negative thing because it, these things are connected. They are definitely connected. But if I don't stop the bleeding here and, you know, I'm talking about something over there, but I need to stop the bleeding here first. And, and then we can, we can definitely talk about what happened over there as well. Uh, so for me, it is a, it is something, uh, uh, an area of just focus. Um, and, uh, last night I was teaching a class and, and the class is on accountability. We're talking about accountability and um, there was so much redirection in that class on, hey, we're going to stay on task. We're talking about the behavior that you were talking about. We're not talking about what the person said to you. Yes, they said this to you. Yes, that was hurtful. But where did you think that it was OK to say, OK, I want to do this behavior to that person? So there again, there's a redirect and bring it back to the center of the room. I think focusing on the center of the room with the issue, I think is, is paramount when it comes to this because it, it does get sort of uh, diluted with a lot of different other, of, of, of other issues. Um, I think Oliver wants to jump in. Oliver, you have something you want to keep us focused back yeah. in there? Yeah, I, one of the things I think is that we have to learn as a community and I hope people don't want to beat me up as a consequence of this, but uh, we had to learn how to walk and chew gum at the same time. So violence against women is something that's problematic and we've got to deal with. But we also have to deal with community violence and violence against African-American men. It, historically, you know, when you've tried, to, I've tried to talk to a number of African-American focused organizations over the years. They only want to talk about uh, violence towards and abuse towards African-American men. I'm a black man that's dealt with this. So I realize how important that is. But I also have been in this field for a long time and talked to black women and women from uh, other cultures. Uh, but I, I realized that, you know, violence towards them and abuse towards them is important too. And as a community, we've got to find ways to be able to deal with both sets of issues. Now, when the stuff was going on with Chauvin, I said, you know, we need to focus on dealing with that and dealing with his conviction. But, you know, there, there's a lot of other issues in terms of the rates of uh, black men that when they, the ways that black men have been treated when police come is problematic. Uh, and the way the community responds to uh, uh, what happens to black men is, is an issue that we have to reconcile. Police have to be seen as a resource and not an intrusion. Black people have to uh, acknowledge that violence against women is a crime. And I think we do on some level, but in some level, uh, the battered woman pays a price because they don't like the, uh, the fact that uh, law enforcement comes in to try to deal with him, but they deal with him very poorly. So we have to unpack that stuff uh, to be able to keep her safe and supported and also, we have to deal with how, you know, men are treated. That brother that got shot in Wisconsin, uh, when his, uh, uh, he was there, we had a domestic violence charge, and the, 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 the uh, inability for the law enforcement folk to be able to make choices about what they do to deal with that circumstance, to me, was a problem uh, about judgment. And that they could have dealt with that in, in different ways than they, than they did. But we have to figure out, you know, how we can have both conversations uh, happening and how we deal with it. Because if we don't, then we're going to, you know, com continue to repeat the same kind of challenges that we have in the community. And, uh, uh, so one thing I wanted to throw out to the group, and, and it's, I know it's still rampant, we don't even talk about that much, but women are being snatched off the streets yeah. daily. That's right. being put into uh, sexual organizations, they're being trafficked, they're being done many different things. But we don't, it's, we don't even talk about that much. And we know it's happening every day. So how do we help support those women? And I know I'll see women sometimes tell me, say, you know, um, 
you know, I could be being uh, assaulted and men just walk by. Men don't even glance and even say, hey, since I can help you, what's going on and step in. So how do we, for those of you who are experts out there, how do we become interrupters and being interrupters that we're not getting in the situation where we're actually putting her in more danger because on one of the other shows we said, uh, one of the guys, uh, somebody in the barbershop said, you have to be careful. I think it was Jerry or somebody said, you know, because then the, the perpetrator turned around and said, oh, that's your boyfriend? Who is he? And then she has to go home with this person, but we can't, how do we interrupt that in a safe manner? Well, Beth Ritchie's the person to talk about. Uh, she's at University of Illinois, Chicago. And she has conversations about young women that were being picked up off the bus stop you know, and, and uh, treated inappropriately and uh, uh, in different ways by strangers as well as people that, that they may know. So Beth Ritchie at University of Illinois Chicago is a person you need to have conversations uh, with about that. Um, and, you know, that also happens in some different countries as well. You know, that we, uh, giving some attention to how uh, women get treated in those circumstances is something that I think is real important. So. so we have about a half hour left before we have to log out. And I really want to be become get some strategy about being interrupters. How do we how do we help the, and get that? I know we have all these experts on here. How do we tell our audience out here how to be positive, how to be able to be able to help give people information, be able to be that person who can step in and interrupt this domestic violence that, that happens on. So anybody have any uh, solutions or Maybe some lead-in. Uh, uh, um, go ahead, Ms. Uh, Williams, go ahead. I Hannah, see you. Okay. Hannah, I'm a, I just wanted to make sure, Hannah, are you sure you don't want to go first? Okay. Um, and I do just want to clarify, are we talking about, in your example, Scott, are you talking about sex trafficking, human trafficking? Both. I, okay. I would say both because it, it happens to women so often and we don't really, we know it happens, but we don't say anything about it in yeah. both instant, instances. Um, well, actually, I, I remember doing a, having a presentation on this recently, and it's actually a really small percentage of women who actually are picked up off the street or taken into sex trafficking in that format that you all are talking about. It's a common misconception. Um, most of the time when women enter into um, sex work, it's because of somebody that they know got them into it. And so maybe it was somebody that they trusted. Maybe there was an element of course, but it's um, less likely for that to be the case. And Hannah, please correct me if I'm wrong with this, but it's much much less likely for that to be the case. And at One Love, um, is it okay if I share my screen really quickly? Yeah, yeah okay. and they got some good stuff. Okay, so at One Love, we believe, and Hannah had alluded to this earlier that, um, is we could talk about all of these many forms of violence, but it's it does more work if we just talk about all of them because they all at some point have this power imbalance that also Q has mentioned this 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 um, control dynamic. And so um, thinking about sex trafficking or any other kind of unhealthy relationship, I guess we can just frame it as an unhealthy relationship for right now. Maybe it might turn into something abusive, like the situation that you talked about, Scott, some, uh, that, that is an abusive situation or an intimate partner violence or domestic violence. Um, but we believe at One Love that before any of that violence even happens, there a lot of times are warnings and there are signs. And so we use this language at One Love um, and, and this is not language that we made at One Love at all. This is language that was already out there. We just put it together on a piece of paper and said, hey, this seems like a lot of the warning signs that a lot of survivors and, and what research shows um, have said that they've have, have said that they've experienced when it comes to an unhealthy relationship. And so just to give a little bit of context, it's not, if you look at the right hand side of the screen, it's not just one of these behaviors um, that we think are indicative of an unhealthy relationship, it might be a pattern of them. Um, and so it might be a pattern of one of them, or it might be a pattern of all 10 of them. But they are most of the time good warning signs that somebody maybe is in a relationship that isn't the healthiest for them. Um, if there is some intensity happening in that relationship by the person who's perpetrating the unhealthy behaviors, or maybe they're being possessive. Um, maybe that possessiveness is being driven by many different things. Maybe it's jealousy, maybe it's insecurities. Um, but just to name a few, these behaviors are kind of at one level, we believe they fall on a spectrum. And so when we talk to young people, we work really, really hard to figure out um, what that spectrum looks for, like for them in their lives and what interrupting it actually means. And so maybe intensity at first is your best friend 
saying, hey, skip class. It's not that serious. Um, let's just, you know, let's just do whatever. Skip work. It's not that serious. We, we were hanging out too long last night. Skip work. Let's play the game all day. Um, versus intensity on the more, more dangerous end of the spectrum is when a partner or a friend or a family member is not really giving you the option and, and more and the dynamic is more of one in which there is control. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to share this as some language that we use at one level. We believe it's so powerful. There are words that have been thrown around tonight, like racism. Um, I had mentioned homophobia and transphobia, but if you think about some of those issues, they're not as simple as these words, but I'm 100% sure you could use some of these unhealthy words to describe your experiences with those different things, with racism. I can use some of these words to describe my experiences with racism. I can use some of these words to describe how I've seen the people in my community perpetrate transphobia and homophobia um, in a way that young people don't even actually feel like they can practice some of these healthy behaviors because they can't even be them true selves and, and their true selves in certain environments. So I think it really starts with creating, interrupting that cycle, bystanding, um, really interrupting that cycle that oftentimes turns to abuse is having these conversations earlier and earlier. Yes, like A said, in the womb, but once your children are here, once they are out, um, finding intentional opportunities to model what healthy behavior looks like, model what trust looks like, to a three-year-old, show them what it means to trust someone in your home, show them what it, what it feels like, what trust, not, not what it means, not what it, the definition means, what does trust um, look like, what does it sound like, um, all of the above, what does healthy conflict look like, when you're tight, when you're really tight, what does it mean to actually say, I'm going to pause for a sec, and I'm going to practice healthy conflict with this individual, even though this individual is doing one of these unhealthy behaviors to me, I'm going to own my behaviors in this situation. So showing a young person what that actually looks like is giving them power. It's giving them power in their life to, to, to label what they're experiencing, to choose healthier for themselves, and also to understand how to get to a healthier place. Because no, there's, we can't say that once you teach this to a young person, they're never going to get into an unhealthy relationship because that's not how it works. Um, but once you empower them with some of this language and some of the tools, the resources that you all are talking about, the resources, the free resources that they could have in their back pocket, um, you are actually teaching them how to interrupt that cycle in their own lives. So this language is just one of the many tools that we use at One Love. I'm gonna stop sharing now. I'll leave some space for Hannah, but it's, it's amongst many other topics that we talk about, like navigating endings or communicating boundaries and practicing consent. Um, it's one of the many tools that we believe at One Love, the earlier you, and earlier you start teaching young people what those words and what these tools look like for them, um, that cycle that oftentimes leads to abuse, we can interrupt and we can change it. Okay, thank you, Hannah, for giving me that space. Yeah, no, you touched on a lot of the things I would say um, to Scott's question. And I do think that, I guess I'll look, I'll, add something to the actual street question, Scott, um, which is that, and then I have a couple add-ons to what Nalicia said. So um, there is a really great resource uh, through an amazing organization called Hollaback, uh, which is um, geared towards the, a new campaign that they've been running for about a year now, maybe even more, COVID makes everything a little blurry. Um, that stand up against street harassment. And I do, I think it's a bit of a misnomer because I think it's a really great accessible training for community members to think about the ways that they can intervene in a whole host of things. Um, and so I'll, I'll throw it in the chat after I'm done talking so everybody can see it because it's a free online training, um, bystander intervention training. And actually Hollaback has a lot of great resources. But I think, uh, and this might, I may be biased because what I do <laughs> for a living, but I think a lot of the intervention is, is also through parents and like giving parents better skills and tools and neighbors and friends, but also teachers um, and the people that our office looks to train and give tools and best practices. Because to your point around um, the uh, often invisible often black and I want to say often transgender young people who are harmed and brought into the sex trade, you know, at an age that makes it impossible for them to have chosen. Um, we are working with the Department of Education now to think about how we can create a protocol so that the school system is even thinking about these things and understanding how they can engage with young people 
um, who may, to Nelisi's point, it may not be so obvious because they haven't been kidnapped, but because there's different signs um, and they've been brought into an unhealthy and abusive relationship that then leads to that. So I think some part of being, I think the city and systems need to do better to improve how we're engaging with young people and helping them and seeing them um, so that this just doesn't get brushed under um, under the rug. And on the parent front, um, I just, I have to mention, I'll get a little personal. Um, I do think that your somebody asked a question earlier about, um, I think it was kind of in the line of like how women and, and actually pick black women in particular are sexualized through images we see and clothing and things like that. I actually, um, I think sometimes that allows us to put blame on um, young women um, when we talk about it only from that angle, when really we should be able to wear what we want. And I struggle with this with my ex-husband who I have a good, most of the time, healthy co-parenting relationship with because I think he is not always modeling healthy relationship skills with me when he's talking about how I should be like directing them to wear more appropriate clothing. And I'm like, what does that even mean? Um, like, first of all, what does that mean? And also he's messing with the wrong person because this is what I think about and sleep thinking about. Um, we should be empowering people to make healthy decisions um, and keeping them safe in other ways and not necessarily thinking that that I don't you know that that's actually what's going to keep them safer like in the long term and I think he's like yeah 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 you're going to change the world I know that's your goal but I'm thinking about right now I'm like no right now this is important for us to talk about this a certain way well so Hannah Q and I are going to kidnap out the world is, and and knows how to handle herself but go ahead so Hannah Q and I are going to kidnap him we'll bring him into a workshop okay so <laughs> thank you the Q great Q <laughs> right 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 you got a lot to say. Uh, First off, just a quick plug for the my organization. We do bystander trainings and we talk about like the things that uh, Nalisha and uh, Hannah talked about. But like, you know, I, I talked about that last time we had a round table, uh, Scott, about what do you do in that moment? And it's, first of all, it's not a one size fits all, right? So it depends on where you're at, what's going on in that situation. And like, you know, a lot of times the wrong thing we, we do is that we, um, we approach the person who's being harmed, right? And all that does is, if we're talking about if it's a woman that's being harmed, we set her up. Because like I said, you're not going to be there the whole night. You know, you're not going to um, You create like a, a paranoia. How do you know this person? Are you in a relationship with them? All those things can happen or may not happen. But sometimes it's, it's important that we approach the person um, who's doing the harm, right? It's in a creative way. You know, like I told you before, before I start, first, first started doing this work, I'd walk right in the middle, put my arm around a guy, try to have a talk with him about what he's doing. And then we, we're in a fight, right? So it's like um, trying to figure out, and you, you, don't have to, you, you don't have to do it like uh, all in that moment, right? Because you have to look, assess if I'm getting involved right now in this moment, will I make it worse, right? Sometimes you could just, from afar saying, hey, are the two of you okay? Right. Or um, are you OK, brother? You don't have to deal with that on your own as a strategy. Right. To say, you know, he, he, it might be he's doing all the harm. But in this moment, he may need to hear that because, in you know, a lot of abusive partners I've worked with and doing groups, they feel like they're the one being victimized and they're doing all the harm. Right. So sometimes you got to figure out assess the situation. Um, I would say this, you know, um, really to really figure out, I have these four C's, these four C's, Q's four C's. The first C is having the courage to do anything about this, right? And part of that courage is to figure out what I feel comfortable in doing. Sometimes you don't feel comfortable jumping right in the middle of it because you can make it worse or you really don't know what to say. The second C is um, really being creative, creative in that moment. So like, how do I, how do I do this? How can I get them apart? How can I you know, separate this person um, just in the, the space vicinity? How can I get somebody else involved, right? I'm not a proponent for, 
you know, because it could be somebody who's both people undocumented and getting police involved, but like figuring out a creative way of getting some assistance or some resource to both of them, right? So don't make it about what he's doing, make it about how it makes you feel. I feel uncomfortable about what I'm seeing and what's going on. So it's not about putting the onus on her saying that you're doing something to her and it's wrong. I feel uncomfortable about what's going on. Make it about you and not about them. Um, the, other, the other C is um, the consistency, right? If you may know this couple in your, in your apartment building or in your neighborhood, consistently check in with both of them. Not that one time people tell me, oh, Q, man, I, I tried it. They didn't listen. What's wrong with them? I was like, how many times did you get, you know, get involved in a respectful way? Oh, that just that one time. But A, you can speak to this. You got to be consistent in that neighborhood. You have to constantly check in and then check in again after you checked in, right? So the consistency, but then just having communication. This is one way, right? The men's round table that I do, women start having conversations about this before it happens. Because we, we become so reactionary that we try to figure out in that moment what needs to happen. And sometimes it's not about that moment per se. Of course, you don't want anybody to get hurt, but it might be seconds after that or in my neighborhood, putting up a flyer, putting up, putting up some resources in general places and not singling them out per se, but making it a, a neighborhood issue, a floor issue, uh, you know, it's happening on this block issue type of thing. So I'm not giving you any exact answers because it's not a one size fits all, but you gotta be kind of creative and courageous to figure out uh, how to get involved. So let's go to you, Lester, and then go to uh, AU. You, Lester? Hey, Q, good stuff, man. That's some really good practical stuff. To, um, to do from a prevention standpoint, by standard standpoint as well. Um, another one, you know, at Men Stopping Violence, I, mean, I haven't said a lot about our organization. In our intervention program, I mean, we do a lot of things, but we do have a 24 week intervention program. And one of the requirements for any facilitator of that class, of those classes, is that he goes through the class as a participant. The idea that he does his own work for those 24 weeks, like any other man, we do not believe in good guy, bad guys. We are the guys and it's us. And that's, you know, speak to one of our core principles that we are the work. And so from a prevention standpoint, I, you know, let's start with us too. That's a really important part of all of the work that we're thinking about. How are we in our own relationships, you know, with our partners, our family members, our children, how are we doing? How much are we embodying the very, you know, issues that we, we're trying to address? Because so often in that helper position, we look so much outside of ourselves and right there in the mirror is, is, is so often where the work needs to begin. So I just want to really acknowledge it because I see the struggle in the idea of how to so oftentimes intervene. A lot of men intervene. They want to use violence to solve violence. You know, like, man, I'll beat his blank, you know? <laughs> And a lot of time men are afraid and uncertain about how to approach another man in a way that is, is respectful and would increase the possibility for some kind of um, positive outcome, you know? So we are the work. It's so I know AU, you, you do a lot of stuff. So I know AU, you do a lot of stuff in the community of interrupting and, and getting people and families not to, um, not to react or, or, or try to get even with situations mm -hmm. that happen. Do you have some suggestions of, of how you all do that also? Yeah, two things. And then I want to touch on that piece that Q talked about, uh, simultaneously grabbing and not blaming either ones that were involved. But what we, you know, what Life Camp does, you know, we make sure that if there's something did happen, our, our really, we're known for stopping the retaliation, which is very important. You know, we have a hospital, we have hospital responders that did this incident, shooting incident. You know, I sent, you know, uh, two individuals to the hospital and then a third one, two individuals to make sure that the hospital is safe because that's an environment where young people want to become violent. You know, you have a lot of different cliques and gangs that meet up at the hospital to see if they see any more of their ops coming up. You know, so we make sure that we get there before anybody gets there, even before the person that is injured. You know, and then the same, then we go to the areas from both places. If we, you know, this is why it's very important for us to get those, that information very quickly. So we go to separate um, places where the, the ops were, you know, um, and talk, hey, stand down. 
stand down and do do those different things. And so after that, he was talking about consistency. Now those are our new homes now. That's where we live at now. That's where the people in the arms are going to be at tomorrow, tomorrow night, tomorrow night. We're going to, we're going to be there when you're drinking. You're going to be mad at us because we say, you know, we ain't going to take a drink. We drink on Friday, and then Friday, you won't see us on Friday. You know, so there's a lot of strategies that you have to use. But, you know, I, the, the, when Life Camp was called, and I think someone was talking about, I think it was uh, the brother was talking about, Oliver was talking about the police. And, you know, at that time, you know, the October 8th thing, you know, with the man, and I'm not going to go into that whole story, but we were called to get the man out of the tree after the police were there for 24 hours. And interesting to, and cut to the, to the, to, to the end of the story, after we eventually, eventually, I was able to eventually get this guy out the tree, you know, we had the same time make sure that his mother, because it was a domestic violence call, we had to make sure the mother was safe, right? But then we made sure the mother was safe he got angry because we was take, paying attention to the mother. Then the mother got angry because we, you know, so then we had to separate them, send her someplace and really just stay on top of him. You know, and this is without the NYPD when I asked them to remove themselves on that Friday. So it, it can happen, but co-producing public safety is, is, is the manner of respect that when you um, agree or you say in word or deed in the contract that you're going to do a particular thing, you have to do it. I think, you know, um, it's beautiful that you know, I think the different things and different angles that we come to, we really can't approach this this uh, prevention thing quickly. Because Right Camp also created the, the, the wraparound services concept under Erica Ford with, you know, therapeutic services. And then it, all these things that individuals that either are going to be, look like he's uh, going to be involved. He has a tendency to be that. So we go to people even before they start shooting or start being violent and we work on them. And that's the prevention. If we look at clicks and crews, who are the individuals that we're dealing with and who are the individuals that are around them? So, you know, you, we got to get the people that are around the violence also. And I think the prevention, when it gets to that age, we have to, you know, the schools, you know, what schools are having problems, who's that, you know, you know, there's, there's so many things that um, it has to be done. And you can't say this, in one barbershop talk, and I just, I'm very glad that you have this, you know, and so I think what the consistency is on, is the onus is on us is like Miss Dixon says, where do we go from here? And so, you know, because the people that are aware what's happening, we're going to be the ones that in, in God's eyes, that, that's going to be accountable and responsible for this change or remove yourself from, not, I'm not saying this to any, anybody, I'm speaking on the whole sense, that this is this is this is not a game. We're, we're losing young people, families, children, and our in our communities, and eventually our country. You know, and then the question is, who perpetrates who, or who perpetrates the violence, the country or the or, or the people? And you know, we started you know a long time ago with a declaration, and we were we were we were we were we were, we were, we were involved and entangled, you know, with, with a, a whole uh, whole a whole amount of things. You know, we were coming into this country trying to formulate that. And then they seen this, this group of people that would be ideal to make this country rich. And the black and brown people is those ideal people. You know, and so now it's time for us to recognize not just black and brown people, you know, but the country as a whole to recognize the wrongs that have been done that put us in all these other, other places. And I just wanted to say that the prevention starts at, with us, you know, yeah. and then us sitting down and having... Uh, all, you know, having, you know, the seminars, the, all these trainings and stuff like that, and going out there and applying it to people, not waiting for people to come into service and apply it to them, but it's going to those people. Can I add wow. real quick to the bystander, just really quick to the bystander piece that Q was talking about? I just want to add yes. to that. Um, when, you, when someone is in that mode and there's and, and, and when someone is intervening, that person who is who is uh, uh, the offender or perpetrator, if you will, we have to understand the physiological uh, uh, sense of what's happening. They, their brain is snapped into that animal brain, the limbic system. And so the yeah. goal when you're intervening is to bring them back to the prefrontal cortex, to the frontal lobe. And so I, yeah. I, was, I, was, I was at the grocery store recently and two gentlemen were in the parking lot and these were two elderly gentlemen and they were going at it and they were about to, and it was over a parking space. And I walked over to one of them and I said, I said this, I said, Hey, are you okay? 
And then he looked at me and he says, no, he did this. I was like, wait, well, tell me what happened. So I, I switched his attention from there and he starts talking to me and he starts telling me what happened. And I'm like, really? I was like, oh, you look like you're, mil you're military. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm Marine Corps, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh yeah, I work for the Marine Corps, blah, blah. So we start and we went into that and I said, hey brother, you know, come on, man, it's not worth it. You know what? I got a parking space. You can have my parking space if you want to, you know? And so I, I what I did was re-engage his, his frontal lobe and got him thinking and got him talking. I said, don't worry about him. Don't worry about him. I stay here with me. So I had, you know, stay here with yeah, me. And I used yeah. to do that when I worked in group homes with young people. The first thing we do is we take them out of the circumstance, take them away from the circumstance so that they can, so they can get away from the situation. So it's kind of a similar thing when, when it comes to someone uh, uh, in, in their relationship, if simply asking them, hey, are you okay? I, I already know I shouldn't be, I should ask if the partner okay, but I'm asking him to get him. It's a strategy to get him out of that mold. And then he starts telling me his complaints. Yes. And then I have an opportunity to talk to him. And then at that point, it, it, he understands that I care because people don't know, what, they don't care what you know until they know that you care. Happening. He thinks that, you know, at that point I care so we, we can actually have a conversation and then I can speak and implant into him. Hey, you know, uh, have you been over to uh, Brother Q's place? You know, they got, they got some good programs over there. I mean, you might want to go stop by there and talk to them, you know, or, or see Dr. Oliver or, or you Lester or whoever. But it's establishing a very quick relationship with them. Very, very quick. And, and, and re-engaging the, the, the frontal lobe so that they can start thinking. But I just wanted to add that piece. Oh, no, Don, that yeah. was perfect because we got to gotta wrap up. And you perfect. That was a nice, great. So, uh, Dr. Lessa, I, I want to give, give us an, uh, a last-minute tip that you have as we, as we close out. I feel caught. I've got not doctor. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I want to go to Dr. He is in my book, though. So. <laughs> Um, a really quick, you know, piece there. Um, to Dom's, I really appreciate that about the role of the brain, the brain, and where the person is. I think I will leave with that. Is that you know we're talking about, for the most part, a lot of trauma. I know we didn't spend as much time. Lots of trauma, and for us to learn as much as we can about that, because that is such a key issue that so many of individuals within our families and communities are dealing with. I'm seeing the difference already when I talk about the brain, uh, man, it's just like, men like, oh, wow, yeah, I'm not crazy. You, know, yeah. you, just, <laughs> you, just, you, just, you just got hijacked, right? The old mm -hmm. brain just hijacked the free, mm -hmm. the, the neocortex. You can, you know, so I would, that would be my appeal is some attention to the brain and its role and trauma in getting to where we, we want and preventing violence within our homes and in our communities. Oliver? Oh, uh, I did something for what Futures Without Violence years ago about this very topic. And so one of the things we learned was to try to approach him, if you know the guy, uh, approach him when he's not agitated. Talk to him and say, you know, I love you like a brother. I don't want to see you handle your business like this. Give her 50 feet. Don't cross that 50 feet when you know that you're in that space. The other thing is to take them and put them in your car and drive them to a place like Men Stopping Violence or <laughs> another uh, organization where somebody can be helpful to Dom's programs, to uh, programs that you know are in New York. So he can get some assistance and guidance about how to approach things differently. And here's another thing. I think we need to ask men who have histories with violence what they want to see handled differently in their life. You know, what do they want to get from this? A lot of times they're resistant to it. You know, maybe they said they don't want to get anything. But I think you should ask them, what do you want to get out of it? You know, what do you think you could do better? Or what do you think you want to do to, to calm down in, in that relationship or in a new relationship? And so those are some ideas. Thank you. Uh, Nalise? Oh, I was just shaking my head. I'm loving all the ideas. And I was looking at the piece you just sent, Hannah. Um, I loved that, Dr. Williams. Um, I kind of 
Are we talking about bystander interventions? Well, your, your last tips that you want to give out as we close out, whatever you want to do is your last tips. Okay. Um, my last tips are really to just, I love, um, you, Lister, I love what you said about trauma. I think that we don't um, give enough space to really try to understand how trauma affects our young people. Um, and so, yes, I could give you all the 10 signs and say, hey, make sure you're teaching this language, but there's also aspect of a young person's life that they can't control or even an adult's life that they can't control and maybe that's maybe it has caused some trauma at some point so I love what you said Bulister I think that that's really powerful um I think back to my community the lack of resources around supporting young people's mental health mental health um I think we could really destigmatize mental health treatment in our community and it starts with um kind of what Dr. Williams said, you said just, just, you said just starting that conversation 50 feet away, um, but saying, hey, I don't want to see you handle your business like this. And maybe that conversation looks differently for people based on your age, your abilities, your sexuality, whatever it is. Um, but having that conversation, I think, could be so powerful and, and really destigmatizing mental health treatment, because I think none of these other tips are really relevant if, if we don't even know how to manage our own mental health, um, not, I mean, there's a whole bunch of relevance to everything that everyone said, sorry. It's all very relevant. I'm just saying there's like a piece, like we can talk about some of this stuff, but if a young person isn't even identifying the fact that, hey, I have anxiety, I have depression, I, I have these things that are coming up and I don't even know how to handle them, then there's just a gap. And I think in, in our communities um, that there is this stigma still. We could post about Instagram, we could have um, all of these campaigns, but there's just a lot of stigma around mental health treatment um, and having mental health obstacles in the first place. And so whatever that looks like with young people, with the adults in our lives, I do it with the adults in my life too. Um, Destigmatizing mental health treatment, I think is a really powerful tool. Uh, AU, you wanna go? Um, just wanna just uh, thank everybody. And I hope work as you know, as, as the brothers say straight ahead, and let's help each other out. When the brother Don said something, uh, when I got this guy out the tree, I did absolutely nothing to him. He was screaming for two nights in a row that he's not leaving to the cops. He's not coming down the tree to the cops. I was able to get the cop to leave, and he believed in me after that moment. You know, variables that happened during that time of trying to de-escalate and you got to find what is the main factor that's bothering that individual and make sure that he becomes a K and it goes right back like Don was saying to the frontal lobe so he was he was amazed that this guy was able to get the, the whole hundred police officers including five different agencies to leave so there was very little talk with him but a very little um, negotiating with the police department and we, we moved him out and I just think we have to, when we go into that set, look at the variables. It's a quick, it's a quick thinking thing, and then just you know, find those solutions. I just want, I just want to thank everybody for making me a part of this. Thank you, you Hannah. Yeah, I was going to say that two things. One, I want to say thanks to, um, and I want to say that the space that you've created tonight and through this series, um, and the round table that you host Q, like that's modeling behavior too, like creating the, especially, and I, I don't, I always fight against the gendering of things, but I love when I see my male identifying friends on Facebook, like being raw and real and open and talking about these things because it makes a huge amount of difference. So kudos creating the space. And two, I want to say something exciting, which is that the mayor, it won't seem that exciting, but it relates to what Melicia said. The mayor signed an executive order yesterday, something I've been working on for, I don't know, like four or five years, which is gonna require each city agency to adopt a model policy to how we respond to domestic and gender-based violence for city workers. And that's a whole heck of a lot of people. And it's about health and wellness. It's not just about criminal justice responses and interventions or your EEO officer, officer saying you need a reasonable accommodation. It's about creating space for people to feel like they can talk about these and reach out for help. And I'm super excited about it. Um, nice. So you're the first people I'm telling. The press release <laughs> just went out like two that's hours. Very ago. exciting. That's wonderful. Congrats on that, Hannah. I know that's been a, a journey. I right, got Q. Wrap it up. 
Oh, um, just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's uh, always uh, an honor to be on a panel with all of you, um, but all you know, most definitely um, Dr. Williams and Ulesta and um, Alicia. I'm a big fan now, so we definitely got to connect on certain things. But I uh, appreciate you all in AU, brother. You already know, man. I appreciate you. Uh, Dom, you're the, you're the work. You're the work in action. I appreciate everything you're about, man. If I could be an assistant in any way, let me know. Likewise. So, Mike and Jerry, we had another great barbershop talk. Wow. I, I, I'm already thinking about we have to have part two. We may have to bring this group back next week and, and finish up because uh, it seems like we yep. just touched it and, and we have a lot more digging and a lot more uh, down down uh, down digging that we have to get into. So, Mike and Joe, you have any comments? Yeah, I have a, I have a lot. I'm trying to restrain myself because we're already <laughs> past 8 o'clock. Uh, you know, AU said earlier that he he's a learner and he contributed a lot and I learned from him. So one of the things that, that hit me was when he said we have to start in the, um, in the womb of the man's mind. That really struck me. You know, when we talk about early stage prevention, you know, a lot of uh, what Nalisha contributed, um, this education that's available for young people to interrupt what have been historically maybe not such great standards for relationships or idea about relationships and having information and being able to speak freely about what makes sense and is, is, is comfortable. Like all of that is a, is a game changer, you know? Um, when I listen to the very good and the very many suggestions that were given for bystanders, one thing that struck me, like in the middle of the conversation, Q pointed to something, Dr. Williams went in there a little bit too, like, we don't need to compete over pain. You know, we've been dealing with racism for a long time. We've been dealing with sexism for a long time. And, and what Dr. Williams was saying about being able to, to walk and chew gum at the same time is so important. We can have a conversation about intersectionality. We have to recognize, and we can, we prove it today, our multiple roles or aspects of who we are as fully dimensional, fully realized people. And so I was thinking about that and, I, and, and it came clear to me as I was listening to Q's four C's, like the creativity and the, and the compassion and communication, the things that you have to do, the stuff that, that Dom was talking about, like, I, and, and I think Jerry responded strongly to this too, like, they don't know you care until you show that you care. So whether someone has been a victim of domestic violence or someone has been a perpetrator of domestic violence, if they're a human being and they're in your community, and if you're in relationship to them, you have an opportunity to speak to them. That all you want for your life? Beating up your wife? That's all you want for your life is getting into this kind of trouble. That's, you know, and I, I, I don't mean to say it in a judgmental way if it was a victim, like, is that all you want for your wife? But, but it, I bet people that you're in a relationship want better for themselves than to be in suffering. And so recognizing the humanity of the other person, whatever they're going through and being a part of the community saying things can change. Like I wouldn't have come into this work if it wasn't for Dr. Williams talking about the possibility of people transforming their behavior and the need as a member of the community to hold everyone accountable. Whether people change, want to change their behavior or not, these are the standards and to be able to love and respect and, and stand for the standards of the community. That's a lot of what I heard today. That's a, what, a lot of what inspires me. And I do look forward, I can keep going, but I'm going to stop. I look forward to us doing a, uh, a round two about this. What's up, Jerry? I, no, I just got to piggyback on what Mike said and really what everyone said. Um, the term that keeps coming up, and I just want to leave this for everyone listening, is that there is enough space, right? There's enough room for it. Um, one of the things that uh, what I what I picture because I'm very visual is uh, a lot of the items that we discussed, um, mainly highlighting um, just what does that mean to be a bystander and domestic violence. And then I heard racism and I heard all these systemic stuff. And I see them, you know, as people or items that are trying to get through this pathway. And I see one item seeing another one a little bit farther ahead. And then a panic arises because I need to be first. And what happens is this emotional or issue hijacking 
which is counter to it's counterproductive to everything else. And so um, just understanding what it means to be empathetic. Again, I got to echo what Dom said. A lot of people don't know until they until you show that I care. Right. And what does that really look like? And sometimes that means, you know, making space. And I heard uh, Lisa say it a lot, just making space for that issue so we can ride that momentum and there is enough space for everything else so i just really want to close with there is enough space uh for what we're dealing with if we attack it collectively then we can definitely conquer it as a whole so i just want to give that back to um scott and just be really really grateful and humble for all the panelists that were here that i had opportunity to listen to thank you jerry and thank you mike once again folks as we close out our barbershop for this this evening we want to make sure that everybody understands domestic violence is not the way to go. We have to learn to treat people like we want to be treated. If you want to be treated well, you have to treat other people well. You have to be able to early and have early invention. You have to be able to model to your children how they should be treating others. You have to model how you treat your wife. You have to model how she treats your, her husband. You have to model as a parent how you interact with people in your community. You have to be able to be open and be able to love everyone as you love yourself. If you don't love yourself, then you have to be able to find treatment centers to help you understand yourself, that you can be a better person. So as we close out this barbershop, if you like this show, make sure that you like it, you subscribe to it, and also drop us an email and let us know other topics you want. If you'd like to hear more about this topic, please let us know. You can write to us at DYCD and let us know about subject matters you want or to get more information. We have a, 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 on our website, we have information that you can get more about this conversation and more things that we've talked in the past. So once again, we want to thank all of our guests who came here. This is a celebration of Breast, Awareness, of breast, uh, breast, Cancer, breast Cancer Awareness Month and Domestic Violence Month. We're going out here. We're going out strong. And we wait to see you next time here on the Barbershop. Take us out, Dave.